Red Twilight, Dawning of Power, Chapter 2, Prelude to the Full Metal Angel. High in a tower in New York City, deep in the heart of an R&D building, Tail opens her eyes. Tail is a red-haired fox girl with a halo of nine tails. She lays on the ground of a glass box, curled into a ball. Her eyes snap open as the lights in her room turn on. A voice comes over the speaker in the room. Carol, can you hear me? Tail sits up. She looks herself up and down. Her stomach hasn't shaved. Stitches are running along her underbelly. She gasps as she runs her hands along a cut in her stomach. She yelps and growls as she swallows her pain. Tail looks into the mirror in the room and nods, acknowledging the voice. Girl, you've been asleep for seven months. The voice explains. During your physical, an alien object was attacked in your body. It has been removed. Tail, cr Tail crawls across the room picking up a white robe she had been given. Marks, is mom with you? She slips the robe on, covering her naked body. The voice of Marks clicks across the speaker. Dr. Mercedes Vixen is not available at this time. Taylor looks down at her hands. She rubs her fingertips together, noticing she seems to have developed spots on her paw pads in her sleep. Marks can see that what Tay was doing. He offers information freely. I've taken the liberty to make an alteration to your body in your sleep. A self-defense tool. I've added to your body a hormonal gland capable of generating a caustic powder similar to that of a magnesium sulfate. Tail rolls her hands together, looking at herself. You gave me a gland that generates burning gas. Mars goes on. You were in a fight, if you don't recall. I thought you may have needed a weapon. To activate this, you'll need to force your heart rate above 120 beats per minute. Tail nods along. Well, that's cool. Marx speaks up. Mr. Demro would like to know how soon you'll be ready to go back to school. Tomorrow? Tell looks in the mirror, examining herself. Dad, I feel... hollow. The object removed from your body was 7 pounds and 4 ounces. It was pushing up in your stomach, forcing it into your ribcage. It should take a few more days before your body returns to its intended shape. Tail wags her halo of tails. She turns around, resting her back on the glass. She turns her head upwards, looking into the mirror upside down. Dad, can we go biking? She smiles brightly into the reflection, knowing Marks Carrington is on the other side of the glass watching her. Marks clicks the radio one more time to talk to Tail. I've done it a few seconds. I need to get your clearance tags. The door to the observation room is old. The door to the observation room opens. An old, ill-looking man walks into the room with Marks. Marks turns in his chair. Marks is a century-old man with silver hair, long and flowing bronze skin. A cat cage sits on the floor alongside him. A black cat in the cage with a red collar on, with a bell and the name Nuku stitched into the collar. The sick man covers his mouth as he coughs. He wipes his hands on his coat, then looks at Dr. Carrington. Is tail M001 functional again? Marks leans over slightly in his chair. He rests his arms on the speaker, tripping the microphone. He knows what he did. 
he wants Hale to overhear the conversation he and Demro are going to have. Mr. Demro, I want to ask you, how did my synthetic get damaged in the first place? Demro shakes his head. I have no idea. Mark smiles. Don't play games with me, Demro. I know what a C-section is, and I was given orders to inject Tail with a neurodisruptive agent. It will take months for Tail to recover from what we did to her. I know what you are doing. Mercedes knew also. That's why she left. Demro rests his back to the wall. I have no idea what you are talking about. Marx explains. You have been having Tail subjected to experiments without my or her express consent. Now tell me. What about the other synthetics? Nile, Jude. Demro shakes his head with laughter. You have no idea what is going on, do you? Tail was pregnant when I clocked out yesterday. There are very few ways one gets pregnant. Now, why tail? What are you trying to do? Demro grins. Because she was the first of synthetics to reach maturity. Marks nods in understanding. From here on out, only I will have contact with tail. He leans forward, resting his hands on his knees. Should I discover that my experiments have been tampered with, and my wishes not heeded, I will withdraw from the project, and you, Mr. Jim Rowe, will find it challenging to continue without me. There is a moment as the men watch each other. They stare one another down, waiting to see what the other will do. Demroll breaks the silence. I will bring your concerns to Sean. I am confident he will clean up all of this for us. Mark smiles. He places a hand on the side of his face and folds his legs. I think that would be best. Demro exits the room. He freezes for a moment, digging around in his pockets. He pulls out a card and rolls it around in his hand, looking down at it. Marks, he asks. Marks replies, Dr. Carrington, if you would please. Demro continues his thoughts. You have an interest in ancient languages, don't you? Marks nods. Back in the 60s, I had spent some time as a translator of ancient lore. Demro turns to face Marks. He hands him the card. I found this. Do you know what it is? Mars opens his eyes looking at the card. This card has a phrase written in Sumerian on it. Demro nods along. I thought so. Can you read it? Marx turns his eyes up looking at Demro. He takes a long second thinking hard. I think my time is better spent continuing my work on chromosome manipulation and genetic augmentations. Word puzzles are no longer of any interest to me. Demro looks aggravated. He knows well that Marx can read this. Demro needs Marx to speak the statement aloud. But somehow, Marx knows what he is doing. Marx practically teases him with his snark. Marx turns to face Tail and declares, I'll be bringing Tail down to the physical therapy room. I'll need to continue observing Tail's progress. Demro bites his fingers, irritated. As you wish, Dr. Carrington. Marx opens the door to Tail's room. The elderly doctor takes Tail by the hand and leads her down the hall and to one of the lower floors. Clocko Towers is a military base only small sections of the compound are open to Tail, as she is just led out of her room when she is with Marks. Dr. Carrington provides Tail with a tank top and white tights. As she steps into the gym, Tail is watching Marks. She snarls as she barks at him. You tried to kill me. 
Marx turns on the TV and starts up a VHS player. A ballet is on. Till has seen this one a dozen times before. It is Swan Lake. Marx looks to his creation. If murder was my intention, I would have chosen a much more potent elixir to do so with. Marx waves them off to the bikes in the room. What do you say we start with cardio? Tell climbs on the bike alongside Marks Carrington. You're calm enough. My military record has me listed as having over 200 confirmed kills, Marks explains. What would one more dead body be to me? Tell leans over in, onto the handlebars of her bike, starting to ride the stationary. You're in the service? At my time of retirement, I was a Brigadier General. I served from January 8th, 1916 to October 28th of 1977. Tail looks over. That is like 61 years you held in there. Marks nods. Didn't leave willingly. The 20 year olds were getting tired of being shown up by an 80 year old man. In better shape than they would ever be. Marks smiles. Tail grunts. I bet you have some stories to tell. Mark sets the timer on his bike to 35 minutes. On more than one occasion, my senior officers tried to order me to my death. Much to their annoyance, I finished the jobs, then came back to report on a job well done. One mission, even being sent behind enemy lines, armed with little more than a knife, a spool of dynamite to disable a transport depot. After some time of biking, the two move over to free weights. Tail spots for Marx as he lays on the bench to do a set of presses. With you having spent so much time on the ground as a trooper, where did you find time to become a doctor? I wasn't actually the bullet the whole time. Every time I was on leave, I, I spent time in school. I ended up with eight degrees in advanced sciences. It became even easier after I was transferred to DC. Tail looks down at her father. What are you a doctor of? Biology, chemistry, physics, pharmaceutical medicine, electrical engineering, cybernetics, computer programming, amongst other things. Tail tips her head. What about your wife? Mark breathes deep as he focuses on his work. You mean, where did I find time for a wife? My marriage is a sham. Aqua never loved me, everyone knows that. The idea that we had a daughter together was nothing shy of statistically unlikely, seeing that Aiko and I had only ever s slept together once. Tail, har Tail helps Marx hang up the weights. You're sure she's yours? Marx nods as he sets up. Strange as it is, yes. I had Tara tested for genetic markers. The chances she is not mine is less than 1 in 15 million. Tell Switch is laying on the bench and marks spots for her. That is a high enough of a number. What does 1 in 15 million mean? How do you get to that number? Genome testing. Every family has many scars on their genomes. You can check your lineage. Everyone in your family will have the same markings, the same anomalies. Tell, because a piece of my genetic code was using your construction if we test you we could confirm you and I are from the same family after a few rounds on the bench the two of them start working on the punching bag this time Mark starts the conversation tail do you think you're a human tail leans into the bag throwing a few punches I don't know I mean I know I'm not human but maybe I'm a person what do you think the word personhood means. Marks leans over the bag, holding it still. He holds out a hand, palm up to stop a tail. That is the right question. Tail lowers her hands to her sides. Dad, am I a mother? Marks refuses to reply. The next month goes by much the same. Marks wakes tail up at 6 a.m. every day. They spend two hours working out, then breakfast. Next they go to the library. The two spend much of the day reading. Then after 6 p.m., Tail is allowed to bathe. Then at 7, she is sent to her room. Then, her night testing. 
Every day, one of Mark's associates sets up a puzzle, and Taylor is expected to solve it. When Marx enters the observation room with anticipation of settling in to watch Tail, as he has for nights on end. But this is where the day becomes abnormal. The observation room is crowded when Marx steps in. Some of the most respected people working in the tower were there waiting for Marx. The person nearest the door as Marx walks in is Jean-Claude Lacutus. He is the president of Clarko Industries. He is a middle-aged man. He is bulky with a sharp chin line. He looks like he could have been a boxer if he were only a few years younger. Next is Dr. Alan Wesker, once Mark's assistant. Now he is in charge of his own department. Alan has short blonde hair and is the strange sort of man that wears sunglasses day or night. Leaning over and looking out the window is Dr. Juan Sanchez. He's from Spain. He has a handlebar mustache. Then there is Philip Rice. After Marx, Rice the most respected scientist working on site. He is a tall, lanky man. When Rice first started working in the lab, people called him Beanstalk. But then there is one person Marx doesn't know. A Korean woman with tan and bronze skin. Her eyes wide, her skin smooth. She looks young and energetic. She seems barely out of her 20s. She must be the youngest person in the room. Marx tucks his arms behind his back. And whom is this? He points at the one woman in the room. The woman holds out a hand. Dr. Lai Chi Lin. Marx looks her up and down. What department are you with? Sean slides up alongside Marx. She works in embryology. She was sent by NATO. She was CDC's bright girl. I like her. Marx and Sean have known each other since Marx still worked at DC. Marx looks around. This lab is under quarantine. I do not recall signing off on any of you coming in here. Marx goes cold as he approaches his chair. Sean places a hand on the back of Marx's chair. Marx, you've been sequestered in your room for months. I need to know what's going on here. Marx looks back and forth between Marx and Tail. Is that T double dot zero one? She has changed since the last time I was allowed to see her. Marks nods in reply. Alan looks down at Tail. Where did she get that robe? Has it been uh, de-static? That is a biosafe room. Any synthetic fibers could interfere with the microfields. Juan slides up alongside Marks with a wide grin as he looks at Marks. He brings a hand down and grips Marks by the arm as to confirm for himself that Marx is real. Juan mumbles shyly. I saw your article in Nature last month. Sean cuts off Juan. Marx. What do you have Tail doing right now? Marx crosses his legs. One arm reaches across his chest to cradle his other arm. His head lowers into his palm. His weight leans slightly to one side as he looks down into Tail's enclosure. I have provided Tail with an unsolvable puzzle. When she opens her laptop, she will find a program running. A diagram of a cancerous protein will be spinning in the upper corner of her screen. And a list of 50,000 ribosomes will be scrolling down on the other side, as well as instructions to synthesize a protein that will kill the cancer cell attached to the protein without damaging the host in any way. Sean looks excited. Lychee presses herself to the glass, watching enthusiastically. Sean whispers with Marx. What if she does it? Marx lowers his eyes with a knowing smile. She will not. Sean insists. But what if? The game is rigged. It doesn't matter what Tail does. She will not finish the game. Marx looks around the room. No one speaks again until the test is over. Marx flips on the microphone. Tail has already gotten to work looking over her computer and the instructions to the test. Marx addresses Tail. Do you understand the rules of this game? Alan leans into Marx to whisper with him. What is the point of all this? Marx clicks off the microphone. Were my instructions unclear? Alan nods and leans against the wall, waiting and watching. Tail looks into the mirror. Dad, this looks like a big one. This is going to take me a minute. Tail lays on her stomach. Her tail's fan and her arms cross under her breast. The light from the computer illuminates her face. She scrolls through her network, looking over her puzzle. 
Tail turns her head slightly. Her tails wag as she thinks hard. Her mind dances as her eyes jet from side to side. She doesn't need to compare the images with the computer. Being able to merely see the image, her mind can almost instantly overlay the images. Tail looks up to the mirror. Dad, where did these images come from? Lychee turns to face Marks. Marks understands what Lychee wants to ask. Mark cuts her off at the pass. He clicks off the microphone and turns to face Lychee. Dad wasn't calling me dad ever since she was exposed to INT negative 23. What is INT negative 23? Lychee asks for clarification. Sean starts off. It is a mind altering chemical produced in our lab. Alan adds on. It has been one of our biggest money makers over the last year. It's a fun little toy. Stick a needle into someone and you can start overwriting their memories. Lightry nods. Interesting. Tail calls off again. Dad? She stands up and approaches the glass. Dad, can you hear me? She brings her hands up to cup them around her eyes to try to look into the observation room. Marks flips on the microphone. Tail, please step away from the glass. Tail slaps the glass, becoming frustrated as her mind is still scrolling through the images. Looking at the shapes on the screen has downloaded them into her memories and triggered a subroutine. One ear drops. One leaning in, staring into her eyes, might even see the computer screen's reflection in the lenses of her eye. The cell you're looking at has been infected by a cancerous parasite codenamed H01N12. Marks explains the tail. Tail walks back and forth. She folds her arms. Her nose wiggles. Her head twitches. Faster and faster, the images flash in her mind. One by one, every possibility is rejected. She reaches the end of the list and starts over. Tail looks back to the glass. There are missing files, she proclaims. Marks whispers into the microphone. I provided you with all the data that has been made available to me. Solve the puzzle. Tail walks around. Her hands find the back of her head as she scans over and over. Tail whispers to herself, this is wrong. There's something not clicking. Tail starts to look angry at herself. Sanchez bites one finger. She can't do it. She's failed. Marks holds up a hand to silence one. Weiss winds his eyes. Dr. Carrington doesn't want her to solve it. That isn't what he's testing for. Sean looks to Marks. What are we testing her for? Marks smiles. Empathy. Tail freezes in place. Dad. She spends to face Marks again. Is this a natural or artificial substance? Marks leans in. It is real. Tail reaches down, rubbing her stomach as she ponders. She barks. I can fix this. She bounces up and down. I need to use the lab. Sean takes the microphone from Marks to talk to Tail. T001, this is not going to happen. You are a bioorganic weapon, a prototype. If you make any attempt to leave this room without an escort, I swear I will irradiate this whole wing of this compound. Tail whispers, I can live with that. Mark stands up and places a hand on Sean's chest, pushing him away from the radio. There is a standoff as Sean regains his footing. Sean, as if on reflex, reaches into his coat looking for a weapon. Marks holds a hand out imposingly. These men are both warriors. The men hold their ground. Rice calls out, here, here, here. He waves the group in close. Tail's doing something. The group leans on the glass, looking out into Tail's room. Tail's knelt down in front of her computer, typing frantically. Tail can type faster than almost anyone ever could. Alan turns his gaze back and forth around the room. What's she doing? Lychee holds up a hand to order Alan to silence himself wordlessly. All at once, every page in the room hums. The message check your email scrolls across the screen marks is the first to respond he spins in his chair and opens his email box tail has sent a message to marks and a dozen other people in the building the group gather around lychee whispers 
was this. Mark starts to read over a document dozens of pages long. If we can manipulate the infected cell to change its behavior, it may be possible to uh, convince the cancer to infect itself, resulting in mass synthetic network breakdown in the gene makeup. We can destroy the, we can destroy the sickness by impregnating it and... Marx freezes for a moment. Interesting. Tail may have solved a puzzle that was programmed to be unsolvable by circumventing the rules. Marx leans in, staring hard at the page. He whispers to himself, Tail, do you have any idea what you are proposing? Rice places a hand on Mark's shoulder, leaning over him to read along. A cure for death? Marx extrapolates. A cure for everything. If what Tail is saying is right, we could weaponize bacteria, train them to attack other bacteria, impregnate them, and manipulate at a, geno at a geometric rate, maybe, maybe even use them to repair and replace dead cells, rewrite DNA, make people better. Slowly, Mark's mouth drops open. He quivers in his chair. Tail on a dare has stumbled across something that can change history. If Tail has, if what Tail has proposed is correct, evolution can be forced, corralled, scryed, guided. Mark slaps his keyboard and powers down his computer. He looks around the room in a fever of fear. Marx has never felt as overwhelmed as at this moment. Out. Now. He starts pushing people out of the observation room. Marx needs to be alone. He needs to think. As Juan goes to leave, Marx grips him by one arm. Marx locks the door behind Sanchez. Sanchez looks to Marx. Can I be of assistance, Dr. Carrington? Marx nods. I don't know you. And that means I can trust you. Juan looks confused. What do you mean? Marx reaches into his pocket and withdraws a fistful of cash. $500,000. I in a truck with a refrigeration unit. 21 foot minimum. Juan doesn't understand. Dr. Carrington, we have trucks. Marx cuts him off. I need one in your name. Not a government truck. Not a business truck. Why? I fear I may not live forever, and I have affairs that need to be attended. Juan shakes his head. I don't understand. Marx forces the money into Juan's pocket. You don't need to understand. Buy me a truck. That is all I need you to do for now. Tail sits in her room. She pulls her legs up to her chest, her laptop left across her thighs. It has been days since she has heard from Marx, or anyone else. Twice a day, the shutters in her room will open, and a bowl of soup is pushed in. Till has had to struggle to find a way to keep herself entertained, pushing her bed to the wall, practicing parkour, has been one pastime. Writing math formulas on the walls of her cage is another. As Till stares at her computer screen, a strange email starts to blink on the screen. Till tips her head and opens the email. She reads the message aloud, partly. 01010101011001-0011-0001-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0011-0
Tail Vixen. It is time to leave. Tail is stunned. She has no idea what is going on. She has been cut off for weeks. Lychee grabs Tail by one arm and pulls her forward. Tail stumbles forward, forcibly following Lychee. Lychee walks out into the hallways. Tail tucked behind her back. A gun gripped in one hand, Lychee explains. I work for the Society of Letters. Currently under contract by the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. I was sent here originally to investigate Alan Wesker. Lychee rounds a corner and sweeps her gun across the field of view to make sure the road ahead is still secured. Tail is still trying to catch up. Huh? Alan is a weapon smuggler. For years now, we have suspected he has been auctioning off military hardware to private investors. Lychee pushes Tail into a closet, then slips in behind her. Lychee points at a trunk on the ground. Open that. Tail nods. Uh, okay. She kneels down and pops open the box. My gym clothes are inside, and a pullover. Put them on, please. Lychee requests. I told my partner N about you, and about the formula you showed us the other day. I was instructed to get you to the university at any cost. Tail discards her housecoat and pulls on the gym clothes. Why? Lychee peeks into the hallway. Because the math is good. The concept... Probable. Mark's carrying since inside also. Lychee turns to look at the fox. You changed everything when you bought that formula. Millions of dollars. Hundreds of people. Redirected to work on your hypothesis. That is why I was ordered to secure you. Tail giggles as she adjusts the waistband on her tights. We are on the 47th floor of a military compound. I'm pretty sure we are pretty secure at the moment. Lychee lowers her guard for a moment. Her voice turns soft and motherly. Tail, you are something rare and beautiful. You deserve better than living in a glass box. Lychee leads Tail out of the closet and to the elevators. In the conjoining hallway, using her badge to activate and unlock the elevator, Lychee sweeps the area, looking left, right, then back. She feels confident that her road out of the tower will be safe one. Will be a safe one. Then the elevator opens. Marx is waiting for them. Without a moment's hesitation, Marx reaches out and grabs the two women and forces them into the lift with him. Lynn holds up her weapon, shocked by the sudden arrival of Marx. Marx slaps her wrist with one hand and grabs her gun with the other. A quick downwards roll of his wrist, and he has taken her firearm away. The hand on her wrist pulls forward, making her fall at him, and he smacks her across the chest with the butt of her gun. Marx could pull through. Marx could bring the gun back around and break her arm, and still be holding her, or crush her skull with a hammer strike. Instead, he shoves her into the wall and breaks the slide off of the gun. Dr. Marx Karenson could terminate Light G. Lin. It would take him only a second, and hardly a breath. He grabs Lin as she struggles to breathe. He notices a chain around her neck and steals it for himself. It is a thin silver chain with a glass prism on it. A laser cut L in the center of the crystal. The strange doctor looks up from the amulet to the woman that had worn it. You were sent here by the university. Marx is talking in code. Lynn understands. How strange that you arrived before I contacted you. Lynn regains composure. I apologize, Dr. Carrington. I didn't realize it was you. She goes on. It was W. You had contacted. N called me. I was already in the area at the request of K. But I have been reassigned. Getting you, Tail, and the rest of your research away from Clockco is now top priority. Marx gives her the chain back. He turns to look at the door. I fear you will not make it to the outside, Agent L. You have only three options for escape. And your tampering with the power grid has locked off all of them. That means doors are locked via fire shutters, as are the loading bays. Unless, of course, you have a gas-powered forklift waiting for you on floor 1 or B. 
Then there is the monorail, which is attached to the main grid, but not the backup generator. Lynn explains, we are going to be using floor U. The train was the plan. It is a one mile sprint through the tunnels to the waterways. I have a friend waiting for me there. We will simply walk back to 101. Board the next trolley, and I am back in my office in an hour. No one any the wiser. Mark smiles. And how do you plan on telling me you were here to rescue me at any point? Lynn points. Tail first, then you. As the lift reaches the lower levels of the compound, Mark reaches into his pocket and withdraws what looks like a remote door opener. A distant grinding sound echoes as the door is open. A robotic gun lowers from the ceiling and flips the face to the ground. The gun heats up. Lynn pushes tail off to one side, hiding alongside the door. Mark stands his ground. One click of the door opener, and the gun turns off. Mark lowers his head and shuts his eyes with a grin. I forgot about that. The tower has a handful of sentry guns in case of an emergency. These little droids are meant to protect the workers. Too bad the logic program is imperfect. Briscoe the team walks to the platform of the subway. Flashlights light the door as dozens of men are searching the floor. Lychee and Tail hide along the wall. Marx whispers to Tail, Tail, I want you to know you are right. You are a mother. He turns to Lychee. Lead Tail to the surface. Marx walks into the group of flashlight wielding men. Lychee, sh Lychee shouts in a whisper, What are you doing? Marks walks backwards a few steps before vanishing from sight. I need to go get Nuku. Tail goes wide-eyed for a moment. She places a hand on her stomach looking down. I am a mother? Lychee grips Tail by one arm and leaps down onto the railroad tracks. Worry about that later. Gunshots ring out in the deep as the lights go out. A red glow fills the air. Whispers echo. A star burns itself into the ground, followed by five more mystic runes. Magic rune looking emblems. Lychee squints, then shouts, Run! Yelping, barking, squeaking sounds fill the tunnel. A two legged, long tailed, crocodile headed, bird winged monster appears behind the girls. Tail and Lychee run until they reach a ladder. Lychee pushes Tail up the ladder. The winged beast gets ever closer. Lychee produces a knife. Marx steals a radio from a guard after disarming and disabling him. A voice calls over the radio. This is Dwight Agate, D65. I have alarms going off on every floor. Can someone tell me what's going on? Marx clicks on the radio as he's running up the steps, making his way back, making his way with haste back to his office. We had a biohazardous containment leak on 45. We we're working on locking everything back down. We'll go ahead and start rebooting things. Nuku sits in her cage, quietly waiting for her master to return to his office. As the door swings open, she meows to let her owner know she is still here. Marx kneels down to pick up the cage. He holds the pen out in front of himself, looking at Nuku. He smiles. One hand reaches into his pocket, pulling out a cookie. He hands it to Nuku. The cat picks up the cookie in her paws and lays down to nibble at it. Marks pulls a USB drive out of his computer and hides it in his breast pocket. Then it is back to the steps. He looks to his watch. Time is short. Light she showing up has interrupted a very sensitive project. Marks knows well he is going to die tonight and there is still much work that needs to be done. Project Vegeta is almost complete, but he will not be here to see it finished. There is still Niall, Karen, and Jude to deal with. He will need to subcontract out the next part of this. A few second long recording. A quick timer to set things in motion. That's all the time he has left. Now, Marx needs to move. He goes running down the steps. Nothing else can slow him down, or he will not be able to finish his last 
finest experiment. Mars clicks a few channels on his radio as he dashes down the steps. Miss Waddell, are you still on this channel? The voice of the husky woman comes over the radio. I'm still here, doctor. Miss Waddell, things have gone a touch tits up. I was unable to contact Mr. Driver, and I lost one of our packages. I'm going to need to clean up this clutter on the fly. Please tell me that the refrigerator is running. Marks takes a hard breath. He is thinking just as fast as he is running. This is a disaster. Lai Chi, despite her best intentions, has set events into motion far quicker than expected. Another week, another day, and Marks may have been ready to pull the plug on everything and disappear without a trace. But now, this is going to be loud and messy. Vidal comes back up over the speakers. Everything on G is set up to specifications. Good, Marx speaks. Thank you, Ren. I'll see you around. Marks shoulders open the door to the lobby. He checks his watch, obsessively, as he walks briskly. He takes three hard breaths to slow his heart. He tries to act as if everything was as it should be. To get back to his jeep, he is going to need to take the Skyway on 16 to the elevator in the west building, down to floor G1. He will need to walk across the lobby and pass check-in. From there, he will use the VIP door to get to the ramps. The elevator door smoothly slides open. Mark steps out, dressed in his street clothes, a heavy black leather duster style overcoat and matching chaps. His long, thick gray hair is tucked into his jacket. Under one arm, he carries with him a cat crate. His longtime companion traveling with him, a slick black tabby named Nuku. Marx is nearing a hundred years old, but still looks young and vital as a man half that. Marx strolls across the elegant lobby of the R&D office at which he works, leaning against the security desk, is a fellow doctor, Juan Sanchez. He is a Spaniard with dark hair, tied up in cornrows and a mustache. He switched out of his work clothes and into an outfit only a college professor would wear, a green silk shirt with a patchwork sports coat and faded slacks. He looks as if he was engaged in a compelling conversation with the security operator, a colored man, Dwight Agat. He appears young, healthy, and bald. Dr. Sanchez waves to call Marks over. Dr. Carrington, got a second? Marks looks down at his watch. A hint of distaste on his face. I really don't. Marks begins to approach the desk. Good evening, Dr. Sanchez, Officer Agat. He greets his co-workers with a slow, deliberate tone. Working late, Sanchez makes pleasantries. Marks looks down at his watch again, anxiety getting the better of him. In a matter of speaking, I haven't been home in almost a week, to be fair, he whispers to himself. Dwight had begun talking. Marx has heard only half of what he has said. So, your kid had some sort of an accident, right? That's kind of rough. Marx hastily replies, It was no accident. I attempted to conduct a procedure I was not qualified to conduct. In my arrogance, I made a fatal mistake. What was the problem? Sanchez inquires. Hemophilic glycose disorder, crystallic mutations, type 1 disease. I will spare you the details. What possessed you to think that you could treat that? Marx cuts him off again. Before my employment with Cloud Co. International, I had served with DC's Pentagon Health and Human Services Department as vaccinating soldiers. I was granted a pharmaceutical license as part of my formalized training. Every question these two moderate is entirely predictable. Marx has answered every one of them twenty times already around the office. Marx tunes out again for a moment. 
as he feels around his pocket. He checks for an assortment of tools he is carrying on himself. Agate speaks up. Marks. If there is anything you need. Yes, thank you. He reaches into Nuku's cage and unclips a portable hard drive from her collar. Take this to Ward B, next chance you get, and plug it into my desk. Marks hands over the small tool as he makes his way to the parking garage door. Also, can you tell me if VP Echo Karenson is still in the building? Dwight laughs. You could ask me if your wife is in. He looks down at the logbooks. Marks mumbles to himself. That's a minor formality. Dwight nods. Looks like she's, uh, with Demro and, uh, Wesker. They're at a budget meeting. Good. Could you detain her? Marks steps out. How long? Indefinitely! Marks yells back as he's on his way into the sub subterranean levels. Dwight looks at one. What does he do around here? Um... Cryonics, bionics, cybernetics, gene splicing, genetic research, robotics. Is that all? Juan shakes his head. Dwight holds out the USB drive. You handle this shit. I don't want to risk breaking anything that might be worth more than my pension. Juan and Dwight walk together into Marx's office. Dwight flips the lights on. The floor is scattered with broken computer parts. A smashed TV partly holds the door to the office shut. A cat sits on the desk. It meows and sees Dwight. She is black, with a blue collar on her neck. A chain, a pendant as well, with a number two carved into the necklace. A semi-human puppet is nailed to the back wall in a crucified position. A set of metallic swan wings are fanned out on a bench, as well as an overturned toolbox. A lone computer sits on the bench, unsmashed, as well as a camera and a lockbox. Dwight looks side to side. Not what I was expecting. He notices the cat. He smiles and digs around his pockets. Hey, Nuku! He pulls out a cookie and sets it on the table next to her. Looking behind the desk, there is a wastebasket filled with burned notebooks. Dwight squints. Something terrible has happened here. Juan turns on the computer. Didn't Marx have Nuku with him when he left? With the USB drive plugged in, the computer starts running a pre-programmed operation. A WMA opens. Marx appears on the monitor. Hello, Dr. Sanchez. Officer Agat. Both men look at the computer. Marx's hair is fluttering as he stands in front of a fan. A blue light glows from beneath. Juan looks confused. Hello? Marx turns his head, as if looking around in his own office through the screen. I'd like to thank you for coming here, Dr. Sanchez. I would like you to open the box next to me. The password is 01041643. Inside you will find a 50 caliber eagle. There's also a map and an envelope. The envelope has in it the keys to the truck that you bought for me and $45,000 in small bills. I need you to take my truck to the city of Vern in Florida. But not today. Today, you'll take the truck and you'll go to a hotel. It doesn't matter what one. You just need to wait there for two weeks. When you get to Vern, find a man named L Driver. He's a friend of mine from the service. Don't tell him we know each other. Show him my gun. He should remember it. Mr. Driver, I need him to take my truck to Texas. If all goes according to plan, a friend of mine, or I, will be there to meet him. An alarm in the room sounds. Lights start to blink. The USB drive has finished installing its program. Something in the lower levels changes. Mark's computer has sent a set of instructions to the machine shop. Marks looks back and forth between Dwight and Juan. 
I recommend you get to work at once. Things are going to start getting very strange around here. Dwight looks back and forth between the computer and Juan. This is a recording, right? Juan nods as he follows the instructions given, opening the box and pulling out its contents. Yeah, he expresses. So why does it feel like he is talking to us directly? Dwight looks frightened as he is thinking. I don't want to wait around and find out. Juan ushers at the door. We should leave now. As the two men run out of the room, the recording has yet one more thing to say. The humming you hear now, that sound means I am dead. But like Ra and Christ, though I have tasted of death, I will rise. Christ offered you forgiveness. I offer you life everlasting.